Number line. Good afternoon, I am Dr. Mark Whitaker, Department of Technology and Society. Today's session on flipped learning is going to be a general historical overview. Um, I am, of course, assistant professor here, but I'm also aided by Dr. Mincy Park, or excuse me, almost doctor, coming up. Mincy Park, our graduate research assistant. Um, I plan to talk and be finished by two o'clock, but hopefully the last 20 minutes, I think, we'll have time to chat and talk about different issues that you thought were missing or that I could possibly add to this general overview. So educational, I'll analyze this topic from my own slant originally. I am a doctorate of sociology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And a lot of my interests are environment, technology, and society interaction, but from a much larger comparative historical and social change view. I'm curious about changes of regimes of technology, changes of regimes of choices of education, and things like that. I think those are very crucial uh, systemic points in a culture or a political economy's history where they make decisions of which paths they go. I'm um, also interested in you know, ICT or SD, that's our department's abbreviation for information and technology for so, uh, sustainable development. And sort of my own thing, sociology of jurisdictions and infrastructural politics. I see uh, pedagogy is sort of a competitive area where we can analyze issues of jurisdiction, of uh, education and learning. Uh, all societies would have some kind of way they would institutionalize that, I'm arguing. But uh, anyway, Wisconsin is one of the only departments ever named environmental sociology, so it's a very rigorous place to learn about these social and uh, environmental technical interactions. It's a very large department, about 70 professors too. It's a very obsessive place. My pre-doctorate education, a uh, Master of Science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a few years earlier than that, and two separate Bachelors of Arts degrees in Comparative Religious Studies, so, as well as a History, Concentration, and World History, mostly where we are right now in East Asia. Um, I'll be open about my methodology. I'm kind of treating this as a research on jurisdictions in some way. And the way I would think about this is positionalism. This is Four sections of life open to the future for what we put in those empty circles. And those things can be altered in different ways. You might have a state that, of course, is a theocracy, or a state that's a democratic republic. So whatever people choose to ally and to put into those bubbles really matters. You can have different kinds of consumption, large-scale consolidated, small-scale support for you know, regional economies. For science, that sort of means to me education, religion, and culture, knowledge transmission. You can have centralized you know, distance learning with millions of students all learning the same thing, or you could have multiple regional kinds of environments for learning and for students learning at their own pace. And finance, you know, the variety of different infrastructures of finance. Um, Dr. Tenning's idea of following the Federal Reserve and his simulation talk that we had earlier to following the rise of different kinds of currencies and uh, social relations that they create. So, but also, this is sort of a model of political economy, that within the science bubble or education bubble, you'll find the political economy of state politics, money, as well as materials that are used. You know, there's a in, people are interested in creating the infrastructure that fills the other bubble. So state politics could decide issues of what kinds of educational practices are created, for instance. But uh, let's get into a bit of flipped learning, just background. Why is it interesting for this task force at the school here? Um, mostly because it's a rising interest in the literature about educational evaluation. Um, the three terms here used, inverted classroom, flipped classroom, or flipped learning, all really have taken off within the last decade, from 2010 onward. Um, other uh, Google Ingram that I didn't include indicates that from around 20, 20, 2007 or so, it started to be an uh, interest in searching. So for a few years before that, uh, and a few years after that, excuse me, it got into the literature upon this. But a definition before we begin, and it's important to consider this definition is tentative because no uniform definition, in quotes, uh, in a book that I've read of the term flipped learning or flipped classroom so far. Uh, I'm reliant and indebted, really, to two very good books I recommend you can find. Um, one of them is by Lutz Christian Wolf and Jane Chan from 2016, called Flipped Classrooms for Legal Education. Why is it useful for us? We're not doing legal education, but they do overview evaluation of the whole literature. Uh, a great uh, uh, 
discussion of why there are different varieties of flipped learning under blended learning as well as other things that I'll talk about later. Also, I'm indebted on the short summaries about learning theories and educational theories by Alan Pritchard, his 2009 book, Learning Theories and Learning Styles in the Classroom. So as we talk about flipped learning, keep in mind that not everybody has exactly the same learning style. So this helps me to provide a vocabulary to you about how to consider why it's useful, not just culturally, but biologically maybe. We, it's important to institutionalize a uh, flexible kind of learning in the classroom instead of the, the stereotype, the straw man, you know, chalk and talk as it's called, which is you know, talking at a chalkboard, or the sage on the stage, that's the other you know, stereotype. But of course, like all good straw men, you know, straw men burn brightest when you destroy them, and that's what I want to do too with the idea of flipped learning, <clears throat> that you have a lot of variety within flipped learning. Um, a lot of people that you'll see if you do a quick search, they will define it in one way. It's like this involves video recording of your lectures, and this technique allows students to spend class time that is more valuable on mentoring with the professor. Yes, that's one thing, but also flipped learning is very old, so I'm, I'm trying to wed a lot of different literatures together. Um, but there's two dichotomies that I, in my reading I see, and one of those dichotomies I've already mentioned. One, some stress just one factor is flipped learning. If you do it, you're doing it. If you don't do it, you're not doing flipped learning. And mostly it's around videoing. So that, what I'm, that's what I'm going to call a tactic. A particular tactic is used, and that's how it's defined in some people's minds. Other people don't stress one tactic. They stress a balance of ongoing feedback relationships, um, where videoing, of course, is just one way of thinking about that. Uh, ongoing student-professor feedback, including videoing, and also professor evaluation of what has historically worked in that class over time, instead of assuming that changing everything without ongoing evaluation is ever a good policy. The other dichotomy, some stress is a technically determined idea and always requires high technology, and therefore flipped learning is a technologically determined thing that's just naturally going to happen. Well, with my view of strategy, I mean, it will happen with some people, but they'll still choose the technology to do it. Uh, but also, flipped learning is very old because it requires little external technology in some other techniques, or none at all, uh, like the Socratic method of ongoing feedback with your students, or that's the Jewish word, habruta, which is the uh, paired learning technique that is used to study the Talmud, and which yields to very good oral and combative educational active learning skills, I think, within students. My wife, actually, who's a professor of philosophy, actually draws on that a lot, and that's how I knew about that, frankly. So, anyway, tentative definition after thinking about all of that, four different areas. If you can remember that, that's, I've succeeded in this talk. Material, time, space, and individuals or groups. In flipped learning or flipped classrooms, class materials, class time, class space, and class individuals, in aggregate or in intentional groups, are repurposed for inquiry, application, and assessment instead of lecture talk, in order to better meet the material needs speeds, that's time again, and spaces, that's a classroom issue, of individual learners and or facilitate team-based learning. So many things now are open to us. It's an embarrassment of riches of how we might organize the concept of a classroom. It doesn't have to be limited in time or space, really, um, in many ways now, thanks to a lot of our new high technology in communications and telecommunications. But let's expand this a bit. <clears throat> By the way, Mark, yes. the reason we're using the term flipped learning at SUNY Korea for this initiative is because flipped classroom, which is more commonly used as his slide showed, and as the Google, uh, Google Ngram viewer would also show, uh, flipped classroom implies a room like the one we're in. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we're, we've thrown that model of education out. Uh, education takes place across the street at POSCO, down at uh, the UN office here, the World Bank, wherever, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the world, and experience. <clears throat> right, and yeah. there's you know, flexible assignments in time, too. Uh, many ways you can think of adjusting it for individual speeds and needs of student learners. Anyway, expanding that, 
Instead of only printed books or articles, now course materials can be open to a wider, real embarrassment of riches of techniques, with or without computer technology. Um, for with technology, this is like the wider array of multimedia experiences uh, that allow for structuring class materials, time, spaces, and groups differently. And this is like pre-recorded lectures, technologically facilitated networking, like group chat dynamics or other research assignments, online quizzes, uh, randomized quizzes that require computers to actually uh, proctor it for you. For without technology, instead of class time totally devoted to mass-based lectures, a few questions with potentially many problems to crack, instructors may alter class time, space, and groups differently to help students work through assignment problems or projects, individually or in groups, to solve learning problems for better outcomes, like group teaching dynamics. There's uh, interesting evaluations of how people remember things better uh, and have different learning styles if they work within groups. Uh, of course, some people don't work well in groups, so it's important to be flexible, that's, that's the point. Anyway, why do it though? Why as professors should we do it? Um, one, students in most of the literature learn more deeply. Um, as I was working with Rinsu Park here, we were trying to find some, what I would say, very rigorous scientific research where I would consider they vary the independent variable in other words, they, and then they see if there's any variation off that. Most, most research about this doesn't do that. They just kind of report like one class where I did this and this outcome happened and they said they felt better. There's very few examples where two teachers get together and say, let's teach the same thing. One of you do flip learning, one doesn't. And then we'll kind of randomize our students for those same courses and see, test them on the same principles at the end of the class. Um, what they have found, students do learn more deeply, but it's it's small on the average, but I want to stress that's not the reason to give it up or to dislike it because I'm going to talk about more individualized learning styles too, which I think is another reason why students may learn more deeply within a flipped learning environment. Mark, yeah. the, the Stanford experiment with the physics course yes, may yes. not have been thoroughly rigorously randomized, but it essentially compared mm -hmm. flipped learning versus the old mm -hmm. lecture model. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, Dr. Larson's talking about I think a Nobel Prize in physics, is that right? He flipped his class, he said? Yeah, and Nobel laureate. And so it can be physics. done in many different disciplines. Yeah, we've, we've got some pushback or uh, open critiques that some people think certain disciplines are sort of immune or incapable of doing it. But uh, according to the first run of our survey so far, the, the implications are that a lot of people think it can be applied in many different disciplines. I was just curious, and I'll talk about the survey that I've uh, started this semester too. Anyway, students learn more deeply. That's the first point, why do it? Also, they're more active participants in learning. And when people are more active, they reach into the higher levels of what's called Bloom's taxonomy. They have more creativity in their learning instead of just memorization and rote uh, knowledge that is easily and quickly forgotten after the test. Uh, in this way, the student role shifts from passive recipient and short-term memory booster, really, to active constructor of knowledge, giving them opportunities to practice using the intellectual tools of their discipline. Also, why do it? Interaction increases and students learn from each other. So everyone sort of becomes group teachers and learners for each other in the ongoing feedback. Uh, students work together, applying course concepts with guidance from the instructor. The increased interaction helps to create a learning community that encourages them to build knowledge together inside and outside the classroom. This is, as an aside, one thing that I like to do. I like to set up things outside the classroom with the intention that when they come back, they know each other better and they're more likely to participate and question and push back on me instead of be afraid to talk in a classroom environment. Instructors and students get more feedback is another reason to do it. And with more opportunities for students to apply their knowledge and therefore demonstrate their ability to use it, the gaps become quickly visible. So instead of just testing them and you, maybe somebody memorized the phonics of, you know, the sonics of how it sounds, uh, but this way it's easily visible where problems are and where gaps can be filled. Anyway, another way to do it, or another way to say this, said in another way, as I said, it reaches the higher levels in Bloom's taxonomy. Bloom was a researcher in educational evaluation. He died in 1909, but lived throughout most of the institutionalization of mass schooling from the early 20s, I think. And at the bottom, as you can see, 
you consider that sort of the easiest thing to do. Recall back some basic concepts, then understand. You know, a lot of our tests, if we give tests in class, they're basically, do you remember this? Can you fill in the blank? Can you use this term? Sometimes I move on to understanding and apply. Like using this term, give me an example of how, and students really have a harder time doing that. So I can see why it's getting smaller. It's much easier, much wider base of capacity to remember things for the short term. As he says, define, duplicate, list, memorize, repeat, <laughs> and state. But explain, to classify, you know, to identify, to see why this particular idea doesn't fit modernization theory, or this, that's kind of an applying these ideas, that, that moves into the higher realms of, I guess, a goal for teaching, in his view. Why do it? Another reason, not just for the students, but for us, um, greater feedback. Ongoing professor-student feedback allows us to be better professors. Um, we know where things are going wrong quicker than simply at the end of the class when we total grades. And most, of course, this is not reinventing the wheel. Most universities always have some kind of ongoing feedback between students. But few professors do it without the compulsion of their university. Um, I've typically set up feedback by having extra credits on all of my tests, which allow them to have open-ended questions. So after every time I really test them, I always get a, give them extra points for getting open-ended answers of how I might improve the class. Um, better student reviews and professor evaluations, of course. So that's another reason that, to do it, a more selfish reason, perhaps. Uh, in the small numbers of empirical articles that I, as well as uh, Vincent Park, have found, I'm evaluating this pedagogy that meet my high criteria where you have to vary the independent variable to really demonstrate causality. Um, a slight improvement is noticed in at least three areas. And if you know more, please tell me, because this is going on our website for the whole project about the flipped learning task force. First one is student enjoyment of the class time. It's not a burden, it's not a chore. Uh, and the materials as well. Also, better skills and capacities when they are tested for how much they learn or can apply later. Uh, so more multi-sensory group feedback seems to give people greater capacity to store this knowledge in the long term. Also, greater creativity with the course materials, which I think following Bloom's taxonomy may be related to better skills and capacities as we, you know, as we move up this pyramid idea. And also, what is unsaid in the literature, all of which we hope translates into better competitive jobs for them. And, and in the working world, these skills of flipped learning hopefully will make our students more competitive candidates for any positions that they can shoot for. Um, where we've been, um, if you haven't done it, I, I ask you here, please do the survey. You may learn from the survey also about options of flipped learning. Um, within that survey, at this link, which I've passed the email before, uh, I'll mention four, four pillars of flipped learning that I'll also talk about later in my talk today. But also where flipped learning has been, as I go, go back to my idea of positionalism, it's always this open position of how societies choose certain strategies and tactics of pedagogy. And what we call new flipped learning is kind of what I would say looking at the literature, a very old constructivist centered learning where you have more concern about individual speeds, tutoring structures, uh, capacities for deeper applied and creative uses of knowledge. Um, it's just that that has not been with much political institutional sponsorship in the past, even though it's existed. And uh, flipped learning, in other words, revisits kind of an old history, not too old, kind of modern history, of why non-flipped learning, which is more behaviorist, the punishment, reward, tests and quizzes, you fail the class, that's the feedback, and, and discipline memorization. Why that was mostly institutionalized around the world in industrializing countries in the late 1800s to the early 1900s. So in going back, this is the era where that bubble is still open in many countries. They're still debating, elites are still debating among themselves how to stratify their societies. Um, in very few times, flipped learning or more open child-centered pedagogies have been institutionalized. New Zealand, by the way, didn't institutionalize that. They're a very small country, though. But most countries drew on a German model, um, which came out of the failure of Germany after the Napoleonic Wars. Germany was very concerned, um, well, Germany was very concerned 
uh, that it would have to be more rigorous in defending itself. And so this idea of a very hierarchical call and response, uh, professional workers that don't necessarily think where a tiny elite are allowed to think and plan in society, that sort of came out of the, uh, the failures of Germany. And uh, the German models of higher education and teacher certification went around the world in that very hierarchical way, were applied from Japan to the United States uh, as well. But also, flipped learning is coming back into favor, I think, because we are dealing with a new kind of regime in technology. We live in a world of mobile saturation, computer saturated world, and it, this opens a debate, sort of pries it open from the bottom up instead of from the top down. The more people are learning this way naturally, outside of the classroom, and they kind of expect it when they come into a classroom environment. And they may not pick up on very much unless it fits their historical acculturation into this highly wireless mobile world where it's like a crystal ball, where everything is available at their fingertips, even while they're lecturing. While you're lecturing, they can look things up and verify that. And I even use that to my advantage. I don't necessarily consider that a problem. Sometimes I'll ask somebody, look that up quickly, what is the date, or you know, send me that image, that's for extra credit, and people will pass me that image immediately, and I'll use it the next time I give a lecture. So they're sort of all my TAs, so to speak. That's the way I treat some of my students, trying to encourage them to see, and trying to make sure that I give them a positive view of education instead of constantly belittling them for using their technology within a classroom environment. But anyway, um, behaviorists, the flipped learning styles, and their recommended pedagogies. I'll look in a book in just a minute. This is like speech onward. Uh, we address the German nation after losing Napoleon. Very important to consolidate German skills. There'll be a, a talented one or two percent who think, then the professions, 10 or 15 percent, who will really be skilled, and then the vast masses of the industrialized, growing industrialized world taught not to think but to follow orders. And that kind of model for uh, particularly you know, elementary, high school education, remains very solid around the world, except in a few places, as I said. Um, a few places have institutionalized more constructivist views, like Waldorf schools, Montessori schools. Maria Montessori is one of my educational heroes. Um, but that's also in the late 1800s. But they mostly lost out and institutionalized themselves against more behaviorist models, except in a few states, as I said, like New Zealand. But is this changing with flipped learning now? That's what the open question is. Um, also, I will talk about other research agendas about learning styles, which are good reasons to consider flipped learning. Um, one, there are many different individual learning preferences. That's another research agenda that many people have adopted, uh, analyzing and giving terms for how people prefer which media they learn best in. Also, there's from 1990, Howard Gardner's idea of multiple intelligences, that you may give somebody the same lecture, but not everybody is going to pick up the same lecture in the same way. Some of them will look for an analytical aspect to it. Some of them will be moved by how emotional you may be in the lecture or how neutral you are. Others are following more orally in their mind, the argument. Others are more visual. They need visual cues. Um, also, metacognition. Can students learn how to learn themselves? Is there a way to make them more uh, cognizant of the fact that they're not learning by studying this way and that there might be another way they could approach the same material? Also, uh, what's called brain-based learning, which is people looking at the neuroscience of how memories or knowledge is formed in the brain. That's, that's from you know, most of what we've learned about the brain is within all of our lifetimes, just maybe 20, 25 years. So I want to go into two readings that I have, and then I'll come back to my PowerPoint. Just a moment. Should I stand on the table? Yeah, no, no, that's, that's, that's the movie. No, I don't think it is the same Christian. No. 
I, I would like it to be. Who is, he, he was the who is this picture? Poetry. In the movie Dead Poet Society, 1987, with... Not that printer. Who is this printer? Oh, this printer. Uh, I will get to that in just a minute. First, I want to give an introduction of why flip learning may be useful from Wolf and Chan. Um, uh, the rapid expansion. Let me make this a little larger. Uh, we can... We can read it. Basically, it's a description of the digital yeah. disruption. Exactly. The rapid expansion of technology has accelerated Media speed and innovation, yeah. how information is disseminated. Technology has not only changed the modern way of life, but also teaching and learning cultures. Modern students are called digital natives with every reason. Students of all disciplines nowadays grow up surrounded by technology. They use laptops, tablets, mobile phones, MP3s, internet, Wi-Fi, YouTube, internet messaging, Facebook, blogs, to the extent, and almost everything they do depends on this interface, this technology. The convenience of technology has changed the way modern students learn. They learn by doing, not by reading the instruction manual or listening to the lecture. There is a documented data that attention spans have dropped drastically in the past 20 years, because maybe because of this uh, constant, and particularly early child psychology what habits are formed by children that grow up on this technology that hardwire that kind of brain learning there's, there's also a whole literature on the attention economy yeah. harvard business press book a few years ago uh, the attention economy the attention economy. economy yeah anyway learning habits and learning preferences are very different from their educators us who have not experienced a digitized socialization for the most part while modern law teaching for this book here uh, pedagogy still predominates uh, focuses on reading of printed textbooks, casebooks, statutes. Educators all over the world have to face the question how education in general, or has to adapt to the habits of digital natives. Consequently, one major argument in favor of flipped classrooms is that flipped classroom concept only mirrors the learning style of modern students. Um, that's one, one particular argument. Let's look at other terms for flipped learning. Also, other terms that uh, Wolf and Chan have noted in their extensive research is blended learning and hybrid learning. So those are other terms to search for. What does this mean? Flipped learning shares similar features with another term called blended learning or hybrid learning. Probably most of us do a combination of what he would call blended or hybrid. Uh, they've both been used interchangeably. That means a com combination of computer mediated as well as uh, talk and talk lectures uh, as you see fit. Anyway, in contrast, face-to-face -face learning is unavailable under a purely online teaching. So from face-to-face, -face, totally gone, with a totally online learning structures to the blended learning in the middle, and on the other side, you know, personal tutoring or proctoring of uh, a book or a lecture. Anyway, according to the working definition of Graham, uh, blended learning systems combine face-to-face -face instruction with computer-mediated instruction. But he clarifies that blended learning has combined two historically separated teaching and learning systems, uh, traditional face-to-face -face learning systems and distributed learning systems, with the emphasis on the role of computer-based technologies in blended learning. So instead of using video audio lecture formats, the asynchronous forms, not in time and space, are used for tutor-mediated learning or peer support by means of tools such as email, telephone, real-time chat, and whiteboards, Face-to-face -face contact takes the form of tutorials, seminars, demonstrations, and labs and lectures. In some cases, video conferencing might be used to replace lectures. Just as an aside, it's so common now. I was watching some of my students as a teen, um, and I was complaining that one of their members was not there that day. And he said, oh, he's sick, but he's right now online, and we're on the Google Docs, and we're all fixing the PowerPoint together. And I was watching the computer that was in the classroom with me, and literally, there was five people sort of editing at the same time. It was all popping up with different colors. So what I visually saw as an absent student, he was there, but he was sick and working at home, uh, is a good example of this blended, blended quality. And, I, oh, interesting. Okay. and that's all I wanted to say about that. Now for the other question about uh, Pritchard. This is a really good, interesting book called Ways of Learning, Learning Theories and Learning Styles in the Classroom. This is my separate reason that you don't typically see uh, mentioned within the literature about this. And why is this interesting? It says, the purpose of this book is to review what is known about learning and can take place to present the views and theories of those researchers and practitioners 
who've been able to make detailed studies of processes and complexities involved in learning, like gaining knowledge, developing understanding. Um, and that's where I got the seven points that I noticed or noted earlier, right here. All of those uh, chapters are addressed within the Pritchard book. And they're, they're very good. I will only introduce those particular ones. And a very useful thing at the end of every chapter is, how can I apply this in my class? If, if I believe this about education, how will this help me? Let's go to Pritchard. And first, behaviorism. We probably all know behaviorism. Observable behavior, you know, you, you're, you're here not to increase somebody's mental capacity of knowledge, but observable behaviors, and you discount mental activity. Learning is defined as the acquisition of new behavior, like a conditioning form. They keep mis making mistakes or getting rewarded until they get it right. It's classical conditioning of a sensory response and reward or punishment. And that's, of course, uh, Ivan Pavlov, who accidentally found out uh, how he traumatized dogs that in his uh, study, uh, there was a flood from what I read, and um, he came back, and everything that he had taught these dogs for months were wiped clean from their brains. They'd been traumatized, and, and they couldn't do anything anymore. He got very interested in how they were conditioned, and their conditioning was removed. Also, uh, operant conditioning. Second type of conditioning is operant. This is more creative and flexible. Uh, reinforcing a behavior by rewarding it instead of just punishing it. But the point is, it's behavior. And the person you probably know best about this is the Skinner. Skinner, psychologist working in America, the 1930s onward. He actually wrote a utopian book dealing with his philosophies of education and how it should reform society, um, operant conditioning. He studied the behavior of rats and pigeons, made generalizations to humans. He used a device called the Skinner box, a simple empty box which an animal could earn food by simply making responses, like pressing a lever. A normal, almost random action of this animal would result in reward, such as a pellet of food. But over time, they'd learn by their behavior the, to uh, what is rewarded and what is punished. This is B.S. Skinner? Yes, it is, yeah. And there was, a, what was the book, the Walden or something? Yes, Walden is the utopian, or dystopian, <laughs> depending on your point of view. I've read it myself, but uh, it's kind of dystopian to me. Here's what I really wanted to show, though, to keep this quickly uh, summarized. In the classroom, you know, if you think this is useful, if you have an unruly classroom, which we don't really have a problem with, I think, um, but maybe an unruly society with no common cultural stereotypes or backgrounds, it may perhaps be as tactics as useful. Standard routines and expectations for behavior. You know, if somebody breaks the rules, they're visibly punished. You know, that kind of thing teaches everybody behavioral standards where they presumably don't exist. Uh, use of rewards in a form of team points can be a great incentive to behave as well, as well as to perform. Punishments, like loss of privileges or withholding of reward, is widely recognized that a positive approach is preferable to an approach uh, predicated solely on punishments. Some rote learning may be a useful way of helping some children to cope. Um, I have, over time, with my Korean students, I do this sometimes because they struggle with the issue of language, and I, I, I make up something useful for them to memorize. It's kind of a, a of course, funny we're, we're teaching adults. Yeah, and adults, yeah. too. I mean, this is obviously aimed at uh, yeah. middle, high school, or grade school. So. Well, also for people who are not fluent in the language that we're teaching, uh, or are struggling, uh, I think. Because this goes back to emotional intelligence. It's hard to learn under an emotionally stressful situation. And so some, maybe rote learning is useful if you notice that they're under emotional stress. That's, that's sort of what I see. You can use all these terms and put them all together in your particular case. But it also has a nice Chinese uh, or East Asian flair at the end. It's interesting, in consideration of the basic tenets of behaviorist learning theory, to look briefly at a quotation from Lao Tzu, an ancient Chinese philosopher of the sixth century. Rewards and punishment are the lowest form of education. He or whoever that person said, which also, you know, echoes sort of our modern view here. You know, rewards and re remember, rewards and punishments remember things. Creativity, perhaps, and evaluate 
capacities to evaluate, you probably are not going to be on rewards and punishments uh, that way. So that's the first issue. Cognitive, which is more of my theoretic, really. But I can see the reason why behavioral ideas may be useful in some situations. Uh, the definition here comes from cognitive psychology. You're not studying behavior, you're studying mental processes. So as a teacher, you can either see yourself performing and creating behavior in your students, uh, where they conform to what you ask them, or you're trying to catalyze thought within their minds. Perceiving, remembering, language, reasoning, solving problems, not giving them an answer, but constantly force, put them in situations that make them stop and evaluate and think. Uh, constructivism here is a definition, a good one. View learning as a result of mental construction. So building your syllabus, not simply on these are things you have to know, but here's reasons why you can learn these things. They're useful for these reasons. Uh, learning takes place when new information is built into and added onto an individual's current structure of knowledge, understanding, and skills. Uh, this is Piaget, Jean Piaget, considered one of the most uh, influential early proponents of constructivism. The idea that children, or even through adults, um, people are on different levels of development, and on one day, suddenly they understand what you're talking about, whereas they couldn't do it the day before. He argued that's a biological thing, but I want you to not consider it in terms of this evolutionary bodily thing, but also as a way of classifying your students in your mind, uh, of what levels they may be. You know, some people are far more interested in you know, motor reflexes, they work better in physical activities, and uh, working with other people and multi-sensory input. Um, moving on upward beyond this multi-sensory input, children require the ability to represent ideas, beginning with early symbolism, ability to recognize symbolism and words, uh, begin also to take account of multiple perspectives, empathy, you know, setting up, can you understand this other viewpoint? I do that a lot of my classes. Can you understand this theory? If you believe that, what would you say about this? If you live in this situation, how would you react? trying to encourage people to be more empathetic about multiple perspectives. That's, of course, the construction of goal of education. Uh, another one, PJ says, you know, children are capable of thinking logically in the abstract. Uh, whether he's correct or not, it had a great influence on the field of developmental psychology. And mostly about assimilation and accommodation. How do we individually make our own versions of what we see? That's kind of a constructivist view. And that may be we learn better in certain media or not. Um, moving quickly, I'll go back to the end. How, if you were a constructivist, what would you do in the classroom? Opportunities for mental activity would be paramount. Not behavior, not rewards and punishments, but opportunities, self-realization, deeper engagement with ideas, increases the possibility of effective, lasting learning, social interaction. A learning set in meaningful context is far more likely to engage learners, not just random and remote things. And encouraging learners to review what they know before embarking on new teaching. So at the end of every session, open 20 minutes on questions and ask people to regurgitate what you have told them and hopefully they'll have made their own version in their mind. Uh, encourage listeners with appropriate guidance to find things out for themselves. Don't reveal the answers, just keep prodding them to facilitate that personal construction with what you're trying to teach them. Um, and that's allow time for reflection is another aspect of this. I will not in detail go into these, I just wanted to indicate that people have also researched multiple intelligences, different learning styles, which they call activists, reflectors, theorists, and practice. I definitely see this in my students. And some people, they want to do something. Other people, they want to only think, and they'll say something when they totally understand it. Collect as much information as possible. Um, some are natural theorists. They want to pull everything together and tell you about it, and how they have reduced it in their mind. And they say, is this the right way of thinking about this whole project? Other people say, does it work? Are they pragmatists? Like, what use is that? Is this really useful or not? Those are, of course, you know, great entrepreneurs. They keep looking for practical implications of things and how to make it better. Um, moving on, there's a lot of different tests that are also designed to help you understand the demographics of each particular course, I imagine. So you could give them the, the 
uh, what's honey and mumford test is kite the honey and mumford tests allow you to classify people on supposedly whether they're activists pragmatists reflectors or theorists so you understand who you have at any particular time moving on difficulties of learning um, this is not only handicapped people or people with mental deficiencies but you can see it some people have difficulty with language uh, particularly in second language of english the input some people have difficulty just recording information taking it in integration they, they know a lot but they can't apply it so if you notice that how would you structure assignments that might encourage integration instead of just simply input if they already have input if they already can give you all the tests and all the information but they fail on every application question in your test then that's the issue of integration that you might find ways to organize memory a lot of my students i find have trouble with short with the, how do they keep things in their memory i ask them to remember sometimes eight or ten points of things so i give them a, a little poem or phrase um, they all know the four different kinds of causality of aristotle i mean most of you probably don't know the four kinds of causality of aristotle but because of the things I invented for them, it's easy for me to remember it. They recall the phrase, and then they can talk about it, sort of in secret to themselves, and they can impress people in the future by memorizing the different things like that. So I have a lot of memory tools that I help them with, particularly because I think a lot of memory is challenged in our highly wired world. Nobody wants to store information. They want a quick answer. It's not necessary pragmatically to keep that information in your head at all times, which is unfortunate <laughs> in, in many ways, I think. Output, some people just, can't do it. The time when actions are taken based on the processing. They, they're under pressure, they can't do it. Also, uh, not to belabor the point, but the other chapters in this book, brain-based views of learning, uh, it says, over the last 20 years or so, there's an upsurge in research and interest among educators, what is known as brain-based learning. Uh, maybe 95% of what we know has been discovered in the last 15 years only. And that, if true, is rather remarkable. So look into neuroscience for potentially the ways we learn best uh, and the plasticity of our brain. And I will close with looking at the chart that I set up, which is within the survey that I ask you to do. Um, the Flip Learning Network in 2013 came up with an interesting idea which integrates both technology and non-technological views. Um, and those are FLIP, for flexible environment, learning culture, intentional content, which means do you consciously think is it useful to use this pedagogy or not? Uh, doesn't always mean building a technological edifice. And professional educators, do you reflect upon what works or what doesn't? In 2013, they defined four pillars of flip learning uh, with the acronym FLIP under those frameworks. And thinking about all these characteristics allows reflection on how you choose to interact with your students and what four general variables are available to flip. Um, flexible environment, these are just four slides about each. Is learning flexible enough to allow physical space and time to permit students to interact and reflect on their learning as needed? Do you often change the layout of your classrooms or can they be changed? Some classrooms are locked into one style. Um, or do you often change your approach to time, not just space, but time? Are you flexible and you know some people are late uh, what I do if, if they really are still working I just have a slow kind of radioactive decay I mean I, there's not a late point in my class on almost everything they it's just later you know <laughs> it's I accept things late but with points off every day and the incentive is they still want to do it they don't give up if they can't do it like the average of the rest of the class um, so I'm fle very flexible in time that way um, the term flexible does involve many topics architectural layout learning units, individuals or teams, lesson dynamics. I think that's also important to let people choose the learning units because some people want to naturally choose the way they learn best. Lesson dynamics, central teacher to passive listeners or many other ways of teaching. How can you structure assignments that are flexible for people? Um, give them a choice in assignments, they do one that they like best. A flexible environment as well may relate to capacities for independent study, outside research. I allow a lot of extra credit, and a lot of people do it actually. Uh, in class performance and in class self evaluation. So that's a very flexible aspect. Second point learning culture. Um, do you set up a, so this is a constructivist view, do you set up this way for them to be challenged by the material that you present and uh, allow them to make their own version in their minds? What's the degree that you give students opportunities 
to engage in meaningful activities without the teacher being central. Book educators help students explore topics in greater depth using student-centered pedagogies aimed at their personal readiness uh, or zone of proximal development. Also, where they're a challenge, but not so much they're demoralized. I took that phrase from the flipped learning path. I like that, but not so much that they're demoralized. You have to keep in charge of their emotions. Uh, third point, intentional content. Everything's intentional, I think, but what is the degree you are reflexive about that intentional content? Use more multimedia resources, for instance, and other situations you realize that doesn't work, so you use the lecture. Uh, which, which works best for which media? Which topic? Flipped educators evaluate which content they need to teach directly, since lectures are still an effective tool for teaching particular skills and concepts. But a lot of the people in the survey who responded so far indicated they see a value in lecture for the more abstract and analytical things, uh, instead of learning abstract things by yourself. That this kind of personal you know, hand-holding seemed to be very helpful uh, for some people. Uh, that was in mechanical engineering, I think, where, where they found that interesting. Anyway, professors, you may create or curate relevant content for your students, like videos, online quizzes, self-mastery lessons. Equally, teachers may choose to record or narrate their own screencasts, so multiple media. Many educators start flipping their classroom by using readily available materials and software tools. Remember, videoing yourself is not the sole tactic of flipped learning. That's this idea of flip, F-L-I-P. There's, there's many choices uh, that we can do right now. Um, professional educator, the last point, do you ever evaluate yourself? Um, try to improve student satisfactions and learning, conduct ongoing assessments of yourself, generally demonstrate lifelong learning about their practice, or, or like you here, you're here listening. That's professional educator according to this abstract definition. However, your teachers must still determine when and how to shift all of these things. So that's professional too. Determine when things are working, when things are not working is the best thing to do. And uh, as I said, the topic of where it is, where it's going, one scenario is where it's going is a far more mobile and connected world. And I'll just spend two minutes to talk about this uh, and leave open questions for the end now. Um, this is the subtitle of one of my courses that I with Dr. Larson helped organize as part of our curriculum and Department of Technology and Society called the Mobile Revolution in Development, where we look at those four areas of state, science, finance, and consumption, and how you know, wired computing is changing everything. Is it changing learning? I bet it is, yes. Uh, world history of media changes. What, you can see how education has changed in everything. This is a quote from Marshall McLuhan uh, from his book, Understanding Media from 1964. So wedded as they are to the 19th century industrial technology as the basis of class liberation, nothing can be more subversive of the Marxist dialectic than the idea that linguistic media shape social development, and I added, and teaching and learning as much as do the means of production. It's not just the working environment or labor and ownership that can structure education in a Marxist view, but, but the structure of the media that we choose helps structure uh, the world we live in. And uh, capsule world history of seven points, not to go through, language, we invented language. What does the world look like when we only had language to learn? What does the world look like when we had language plus writing? What does the world look like when we had very simple scripts? Now everybody can communicate, right? You probably couldn't have democracy either without you know, simple script interaction. Um, mass printing, this is sort of early modern. Social implications, you know, requires good paper, good ink, plus mass production machinery, big markets. Um, it's not surprising that the origin of mass printing was seen in Europe and around the world, the expansion of the number of universities, the number of people who become educated, the scale of people who could get a degree was drastically changed. Um, then we have non-electrical telecommunications, sort of like semaphore, news, originally linked to wire services, then electrical telecommunications where we are now, but that's mostly mass broadcast. So what would education look like under mass broadcast? You probably, it's the film strip, right? You watch a film and you sit there and you absorb That's where it. we were in the exactly. 20th century. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so we have this one-way, no sort of mass media entertainment entrainment, so like everybody, Here's the lecture, watch it. But if you just do that with flipped learning, you're not really using it as flipped learning, I suggest. You're really using it as kind of an older mass communication. Uh, but where are we now? Forgive that terrible abbreviation. I haven't found out the easier one yet. CWDIM, 
computerized wireless, previous was wired, no, decentralized digital electronic mobile multimedia. Everything's more, the two words would be mobile, mobile and decentralized and wireless. That means groups can come together at any time and any space, and you as a professor can just facilitate that. Um, merges all the above in a computerized teleconnection. Sound, image, video, all that from the previous now can be brought up on demand and mixed and matched. Uh, also now pioneering digital technology for transmitting, storing other senses, and touch and even smell. Yes, even taste. Taste is already digitized. Go to YouTube, you'll find some uh, early prototypes of how they're going to digitize taste. But the point is, this is creating real-time communities for learners, and it's going to influence, I think, our education. Uh, I won't go into that, but uh, the point is, Nikola Tesla looked at this long ago. You know, wireless is perfected, we'll have a whole earth converted into a huge brain. Uh, and this is what we are now within, I think. You don't realize it, but we're living already within this mobilized brain of cascades of knowledge and information sampling from all sorts of places. And the classroom is not the only place that data will come from. Miniaturization, of course, is now within nearly the pocket of every one of your students at all times. On one hand, you may have a dystopian future, right? You have the controllers without the technology wiring everyone in without much constructivist knowledge. On the other hand, put your favorite image here of constructivism, like would it be more student-centered? I think it can be both. Um, and remember, in terms of the world where this is available, you know, South Korea is very dense. So it's 94% uh, of Koreans use the internet. If you look at Korea again, just a few years ago, 88% will have a mobile phone. So particularly where we are is a very dense zone for this kind of teaching and learning environment, which is useful. Maybe not so in every place, but here with high bandwidth too, it's very important. Everything is shrinking down into one technology and all the victims are other things. Smartphones become a huge hub, so why not use it for education, I'm gonna suggest, and that's where it may be going. Look at two things here, look at the flat line. The flat lines are not changing. What's going up? Only the small mobile things, cell phones, smartphones, tablets. Those are the only things that are really still going up as important. Um, here's a funny image I found. Everything is within the phone. All those little icons are now, so why not use that? Why not use that and take advantage of that as a professor? And in Korea, we are in the Emerald City. We live in some of the fastest internet speeds in the world. Um, there's Korea, the only dark green country according to Akamai. Right now, on the average, that's 30,000 kbps. Uh, here's the Korean green line again compared to other countries like South, uh, United Kingdom, United States, and China in blue. So where we are now and the, where they grew up is definitely within this environment. And I think we should take advantage of it. Um, it's getting even faster. There'll be a subscription service for up to 700 Mbps by the end of this year. And that will cascade down over the next few years. So, you know, two gigabyte videos in two sequential seconds, many things will be opened up. You know, choice can be destabilizing because suddenly you're forced to choose and that can frustrate a lot of professors. But I think if you adapt well to this and think about the four, at least the four pillars I talked about, it's very useful uh, and have given you some ideas of where you might create a new tactic within your class, as well as reasons why educationally students learn in different ways. Okay. And thank you, I'm done. <clears throat> Barely made it in. Five minutes. <laughs> Open questions. Anyone want to add things? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I added a couple along the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think you, you, your presentation was very thought provoking and a lot of interesting and relevant history. Mm -hmm. But I think you didn't push the argument quite far enough. I think we're already. Uh, you know, the history just before this very end part mm -hmm. is, is really where we are already. My own view is mm -hmm. that, that the, okay, if you look at education, the Latin uh, educare, the verb to rear or to bring up, it's mm -hmm. a universal practice throughout tribes, nations, cultures all over the world through history passing along knowledge, learning or passing along knowledge from one generation to another. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, we, we prefer flipped learning to classroom because learning takes place 24 hours a day. 
and it may take place more outside the classroom than inside the classroom, and we don't have a classroom uh, model. I mean, to the extent that we move. My, my view is that this whole uh, flipped learning, flipped classroom initiative is, uh, is largely a reaction, well, to go back, to, so if, if education is passing along knowledge one generation to another, then communication and the use of media mm -hmm. is historically fundamental to the education process, any kind of education, mm -hmm. lifelong learning, whatever level, whatever subject matter. And uh, so the media environment, I, I agree with uh, McLuhan. I, mm -hmm. I started reading McLuhan back in the 60s. Now I have a completely different perspective on his book. I realize how, how uh, prescient mm -hmm. his understanding media was. The media, media uh, medium is the message. Um, and so we're in this media environment now where teachers and professors mm -hmm. better change or they, the world will pass them by. And uh, univers universities all over the world are in a reaction mode, mm -hmm. you know, trying to, uh, and schools at all levels really are trying to adjust to the reality of, I mean, there are empirically MOOCs. Mm -hmm. um, we're still in the early era of these massive open online courses, but they exist, they're increasing, they're available. For certain things, that's how bright young people are going to, are going to learn stuff. Uh, international branch campuses, similar curve, they're here, here to stay. Mm -hmm. And uh, th the world is shrinking because of these networks. So anyway, I, I've said enough, but I, I think as a resource, you know, to sort of the historical strands that uh, feed into this, but I, I would encourage us to think more broadly uh, that, you know, that four point uh, framework. The flip, I feel like. Yeah, I think is a little bit too tied. If you go back over the wording on that, yeah. it's really talking about classroom mm -hmm. and, uh, some of you know what you presented is also talking about children, so it's clearly uh, thinking in terms of well, we're we're quite clearly teaching uh, young adults. By the time someone is admitted into the university, you no longer call them a, a child. But it's not just age. Yeah. We're dealing with people whose English is not always a native speaker, and in terms of but, different learners, there is a linguistic knowledge. I mean, there's- But I mean, my, my argument is broader than that. It's that you, uh, whatever you call it, active learning, blended learning, flipped learning, that you focus on uh, the learning mm -hmm. with our students and that the lecture part gets, uh, gets diminished because of the media environment in which we can uh, approach learning. Teaching, learning, mm -hmm. flip, flip side of it. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Any other reflections, things I should add? I think I was talking with some people beforehand about flip learning that they use in their class. I'd like to hear other perspectives too. I think that's totally open. So. No, I think. <laughs> Just, well, a recommendation that having the uh, recording of this is is okay, but you covered about three or four times the amount of material that in a coordinated sort of slide presentation. I mean, this is jam packed. Oh yeah, full you can of record it, stop it, look at it. Yeah. So it's going to be very challenging for some of our students. You might split it up into three or four, or uh, create a version. Uh, We'll see, you know, that people could uh, sit down and our, our students, uh, faculty, other people could go through it. That's just... Yeah, uh, my apologies for the yeah. speed, but I'm also remembering, yeah. I'm looking at my own camera now. I'm doing this for the camera and the people watching right now because they can stop this whenever they want and look at particular slides at 100 yeah. over 1,000 pixels per square. Okay, yeah. yeah, fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> and you can too when we put it up on our website. But yes, definitely. You if I was not without the camera, I probably would not. So. Did you check the image before? This one? 
I would turn off the lights um, for the video. I took a picture. I couldn't uh, couldn't get anything from the screen. So. Uh, well, I, ch I oh, checked the, the lights. Screen. Yeah. Oh, that one light? Oh, oh you've got yeah. the yeah, the light that should be oh, off is on. It's a pretty sensitive camera. Okay, good. Yeah. So that, 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 that would be a lot. Yeah. Actually, we, we leave the outside lights on, and uh, the ones back there are on. <coughs> yeah, it's better to get a picture of you. Yeah. Okay. As if you're talking. <laughs> good. I didn't Thanks. notice that on the painting. <laughs> Yeah, normally on, on the presentation they turn off the middle roll of lights and then this is our flexible environment, right? Yeah. <laughs> and actually, be one more of the things that the university may do is set up a classroom which will allow for greater flexibility in seating. There's, I mean, most classes allow that, mostly in B wing, but uh, that would be sort of a policy. Also, they may set up uh, a dedicated classroom where you can use a whiteboard and camera. Yeah, and what, good you know, okay, a couple of points, like a couple of points, Mark, on that. Uh, if SUNY Korea is really serious about this, we've got a problem with some of our classrooms because the, the B-wing ones where the desks are on wheels can be moved around and arranged. But the C-wing are not well suited to teamwork, breaking up into, those are lecture halls. They're physically constraining. Okay, and uh, and the other thing is that I, I was mentioning to Anthony this morning, uh, the environment for a class, traditionally, back in the mass media era, mm -hmm. you had a course syllabus. That meant a printed document or a PDF or Word document, very linear, very text-oriented. When I returned to full-time teaching at KAIST in 2012, I used Moodle down there, but I have used a website rather than a syllabus for every course I've taught since uh, 2012. Why? Because I'm living in the 21st century, and you want to uh, link to videos, to, to websites, to um, data visualizations and so forth. And access and a printed, to the smartphone world. Yeah, yeah, so a printed document uh, for a course syllabus, but we're still proceeding. Some of our staff are sending out memos saying, submit your syllabus, sort of implying that it's a PDF uh, document or whatever. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, we should really be strongly <clears throat> encouraging faculty to put up a site uh, for their course. Klaus Mueller, the former vice president before me, uh, did this. Uh, I, I was there at the faculty orientations. He encouraged everyone to do it, but I think we're a little bit slow on the uptake, frankly. I think it's and I, I'm, I'm just pleading with uh, people why, because if, if I can do it, I think more. Well, if most I was to theorize why, it's sort of like bureaucratic inertia. If they're paper based, they want everything to come back into paper when they're doing it. We even when if students are very rarely going to be asking me about that. I mean, I, it makes it very easy to update syllabi too. It would be, I'm very flexible in my syllabus. Like I have a new idea, there's more question about that. I'll flesh that out in the syllabus. I'll upload a new B2 version two, and say always look at the updated syllabus in the cloud drive. Um, and I always reference up, never. I never just say syllabus in my class. I always say updated syllabus. So it gets it in their mind that the syllabus is an ongoing document. It's not exactly. stable at the beginning. And there's a mistake with it, something changes. It's, it begins as a flexible document. Yeah. Yeah. But you're not referring to assignments and things like that, right? I am too, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I've rec well, they recently changed with the SNAP election. We lost one of the classroom sections where they're going to present papers. So now I rewrote it where it's going to be voluntary, where they're going to have this, you know, the second time they do this. Uh, because we, we lost two classes now. We had one uh, during Putin's birthday. Right. Um, good good example of the advantage of an electronic yeah. version. I mean, I, 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 think a, I think a website makes a lot of sense because it's so easy to put one together. Mm -hmm. uh, but at least having it in the cloud and electronically available, updatable, mm -hmm. be a very minimal yeah. requirement. And I would hope that most of our professors could actually... And I upload my PowerPoints yeah. when, and updated versions. And uh, I sometimes, for extra credit, I'll ask, Go find that image for me, and they'll do it, and then I'll integrate it into the 
in the next version. And they see that reaction, like, oh, I'm part of the class. I, I kind of do it really for them to like make them realize, oh, well, what we do wants, what we want to learn, he's gonna show us. It's sort of a symbolism that I'll build PowerPoints around things that they give me to. Yeah. There's kind of a legalistic perspective on syllabi, mm. where it's, it's a contract between the professor and the student, and that contract is made in the beginning of the semester. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, yeah, I, I make certain adjustments mm -hmm. myself. But well, certainly I don't change the way I grade. I don't change the way I grade. Yeah, certainly not new yeah. assignments or the way I, I that think assignments are structured. That's, that's I think a good the point, contract though. part yeah. that concerns the students most is uh, assessment and, and grading. Mm -hmm. uh, I get all kinds of questions. You know, what are, about that? And fewer about the. Yeah, I, I've, know, never, I've never been yeah. flexible in the way I. I don't change the percentage of how much attendance counts. I don't say this paper because you all did poorly or well is going to count more. Uh, that, that's very unpredictable. I, I keep those things in stone, so to speak. Um, that's their structure. I mean, something wrote and visible and stable, I think, is a good backbone for a lot of people. And if you do change too much, you lose them. But if, if you give them a calendar of where you're going ahead, ahead of time, and you can, you can manipulate certain sections of that calendar, as long as you un give them the, set it out in the goal. Um, I mean, I, I I'll talk more about this the next time I talk, which will be two weeks from now, about my personal experiences in both the United States and Korea, um, adapting different cultures and, and what I've done. Mark, I think a point that really needs to be underscored here is that whether it's you teaching or me teaching or any one of our other faculty teaching, they're not the only, we're not the only ones in the world teaching this particular course, this subject matter. The reality in which we live is that there are excellent MOOC courses and, and courses that are online available. There's a lot of good material. So I think each one of our faculty have to ask themselves, seriously sit down and say, why am I lecturing you know, on all of these topics rather than why am I doing that if there's something as good or better than what I could do available? Why am I not shifting my role to being that of a curator and uh, a mentor to the students to help accelerate the, the learning and to get all these other benefits? And I think, I think uh, the, the survey that, that you distributed, um, Unfortunately, I think the response rate is going to be depressed because of the length of the survey and the length of the question in the survey. But just one simple question that I'd like to see every faculty member at SUNY Korea answer is the one I just, just posed. I, I think, you know, I would rather, I think we, we, we should set our sights high, and personally I would argue that to have a world-class sort of cutting-edge course in many fields, like the one that, that I'm thinking of is the new course that we introduced a couple of years ago now. On uh, It's called ICT for Sustainable Development. It's a very cross-disciplinary course. Uh, it covers the four pillars um, of the uh, undergraduate specialization that we introduced and it meets the tech requirement of Stony Brook University. Very cross-disciplinary. Uh, so, you know, uh, I actually think it's generated, not, not that course alone, but the sequence, the specialization has generated a lot of interest from our students. And I would like to think their interest is because they're coming of age now in a, at a time when uh, the sustainable development goals, you know, ending poverty, uh, the world's water supply. You go down just a list of these 17 sustainable development goals. These are problems that uh, our graduates coming out of the College of Engineering are going to have to uh, confront. And so, you know, I think they're, they're up for this. Uh, I, I have the sense that some of, not people in this room, <laughs> but some of our faculty are the ones that are holding back. Maybe because they are comfortable with the old uh, 20th century lecture style. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I agree with your opinion. Yeah. 
I think that your presentation reflected on it's not only challenge for the students, but also it's a challenge for the professor. Oh, yeah. uh, because we are now, rather than the uh, teaching knowledge to students, but we are teaching how to get the uh, ideas or knowledge mm -hmm. from the all kinds of the leaders and all Right, it, exactly. So in that sense, I think that for the professor, what is required is that even professor should ask a question, the knowledge that I know is right. Mm -hmm. Or am I in balance in the viewing? Excellent, yeah. absolutely. That's exactly so you're what the I professional educator according to the flipped learning network there. That, that's that point. Do you constantly question yourself? Yeah. Are you improving yourself? Are you here? You're here listening, so that's what well. The the attention economy that I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. is because the digital network revolution that started the mid twentieth century and the latter decades of the twentieth century <coughs> has resulted, as we all know, in exponential increases in scholarly publications and all kinds and varieties of digital information. So everything, video, sound text, anything can be converted to ones and zeros and transmitted over the air through fiber optic via satellite to these smart devices. It's called the internet and it, these networks are getting denser and denser, but the, it's an exponential increase in human ability to store, compute, and telecommunicate information. It's there, whether anybody, any university professor, whether they like it or not, and uh, that's why I personally see this as, for anyone who's looking at what's going on in the world, it's more of an imperative. We've had some discussions. I meet with department chairs. Uh, I gave a presentation to the faculty workshop because President Kim likes this idea of having it. I, I think it's an imperative not only for SUNY Korea, but for all of for Yonsei, for uh, Incheon National University, Seoul National, any university that wants to be relevant anymore in this day and age, had better figure out what this is. So I'm having a little bit of trouble um, with some of the pushback. Uh, I'm not gonna mention names or departments, but the, people argue that, uh, well, this won't work with, uh, with my department because we have accreditation mm -hmm. and we have all these excuses that in my opinion, don't hold water. You know, I, I'm an old, <laughs> another, Mark, one thing I liked about your presentation mm -hmm. is you said flipped learning has been around for a long time. Yeah, well, it has, but it wasn't called that. Yeah. And uh, It's the old debate about it, behaviorism control versus This flipped learning, learning is just a buzzword. Yeah. But uh, debate, forensics and policy debate, mm -hmm. which I am look back and I consider myself very fortunate to have been trained in that area starting in junior high school in South Dakota of all places. But, you know, doing research on two sides of a serious policy issue, reading widely, coming up with evidence that could be used in a, in a debate or sort of parliamentary debate, congressional debate, which is what policy debate is, is all about. It's about we need to have legislation or laws or some form of um, of uh, standards in telecommunication, whatever the issue might be. And I think our students need that skill today with so-called flipped learning just as much as they did 50 years ago before the internet, you know, when I was being uh, educated. Yeah. They need this desperately and public speaking skills. Yeah. Yeah. Our think... students are weak. They're very, very, very weak. Yeah when it comes to public speaking skills. Yeah, I think that's part of where they, they are now in this regime of private, personal communication without using their senses. Yeah. You know, whereas most elite universities so, tend to basically show people how to behave etiquettely. They show basic forms of rhetoric. They teach them memory tools. Uh, so a lot of the elite universities will teach people how to give a good presentation with their body. And they'll practice what's called the active literacy, you know, constantly thinking on your feet, 
improvisation. Uh, it was unfortunate. Dr. Brown says she tried to get a class or a club set up for improvisation and it was denied project by the administration. So that, that's too much like acting. So she was denied. They still meet. They still have the improv club, but it's well, not an official club tell, because they don't see it as you Spark, get here. Tell, tell yeah. Professor Brown yeah. to do a little bit of research on the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science, which is now a university-level center at Stony Brook University. Um, I, when I taught uh, the course on uh, communication for engineers and sciences in our department, uh, I used the work of the Alda Center. This is very interesting. I mean, because Alda starred in MASH, most people don't know. You know, it's a very interesting connection to Korea, but. For the past 15 years or more, he's hosted a public television program on science, and then he founded this program originally in the journalism department at Stony Brook. And it's all about how to effectively public communicate uh, mm -hmm. science, some of, sometimes which is difficult for people to conceptualize and grasp. And he's done outstanding work. I hope we can get him here. I, I mean, I think it would be wonderful because we could uh, uh, tie in with his earlier movie career. Alan Alda is alive. <laughs> I know I'm putting this on camera. Alan Alda is still alive. Alan his center was just uh, promoted to a university. Wow. Mark, do do your homework. <laughs> We're part. It's part of Stony Brook. I didn't know that. We have the opportunity to, you know, I think to bring him here. Why not? He should. He could, he could reflect on his earlier uh, acting career, but also his passionate concern with uh, communicating science. But I think if, yeah. uh, if Susanna was unaware of that, then she missed an opportunity to help convince people here. Because yeah. that, that center is, is doing real. They've got centers at other universities now that have been spawned from, starting with the Alda Center at Stony Brook. Mm -hmm. And I have had discussions with one of his colleagues because she happens to be the sister of a Stanford colleague of mine. Judith Mayo mm -hmm. is an actor, New York Broadway uh, actor, who uh, has worked with Alan Alda on that and is still in the oh, department. Nice. And I actually met with her at Stony Brook and we talked about the possibility of setting up a program here at. Uh, at SUNY Korea, I agree they need more literacy think, here. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's kind of one of the reasons I like to do more flipped learning in my class and, and force them to learn to do that. So let, they're really shy. Let really me shy. come back to, you know, intentional, the models you use, yeah. I think are a little bit behind the power curve where we are right now. When, because intentional learning, think about it. We've got five departments here, all within the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences. We're an engineering school. So, and the, the next Stony Brook department to come will also be electrical and computing engineering. Mm -hmm. So we're heavily engineering focused. Rather than uh, intentional learning, uh, I would prefer to uh, say something like uh, re real world mm -hmm. problems mm -hmm. focus or whatever you, but because engineers like to, uh, uh, solve problems and and to build things. I mean, mechanical engineering especially, but I argue with Peluso Ladiende that electrical engineers build, I mean, the biggest construction project in human history is the internet. And a huge part of that is software. Of course it's hardware, but it's more software than hardware in terms of uh, the network itself software-defined networks, virtualization, uh, mm -hmm. big data, Internet of Things. Without the software, you wouldn't have much of anything. Yeah. So, on 2.1, well, intentional content yeah. was drawn from this other group. Yeah, I know. And That's yeah. why I say that I think that that framework, mm -hmm. rather than just use that as a reference point, but I think we need to communicate simply and forcefully mm -hmm. uh, to our faculty, uh, why we're doing this, and sort of put it in in context 
so that so that people will will see it as an op actually I hope people will see it as an opportunity. That's why it's an embarrassment of riches. I mean, we have many choices, and a lot of choices. Some people suddenly you're very conscious that you don't know why you've been teaching that way. When you're given, given like five versions of that, like, well, why was I using that other version? You kind of want to defend it. And uh, now I think people are very defensive, can be very defensive. Uh, other people are already using it, according to some people who've responded on the survey already. But I think there's a, a variety of people who just need to be made aware that these are open sets of choices that can be applied. And on our website, I hope to have a long list of different, you know, both social techniques as well as technical facilitated techniques by the well let, let me make one other broad comment uh, not only do i think that this is sort of an imperative but anthony you sent me the article by your um, the university yeah, of hawaii yeah. report um, in the higher education field there is a clear awareness that universities and not only universities are under threat in this globalized world. The primary uh, force at work here is uh, the digital disruption, the growing power of, and, and pervasive character of these digital networks and what they, what they do for uh, how people communicate and how they share information, literally how, how they learn. The learning process has changed. So in order to achieve the vision that President Kim and uh, Dr. Oh Myung and the others have set for SUNY Korea, uh, I, I think the argument is there to be made that you, we either do this or we're going to watch the rest of the world go by. Because uh, take, for example, a simple question, the MOOCs. I, I had a conversation not long ago with somebody who was dismissing that, oh, you can't get uh, college credit you know, from a MOOC. Well, first of all, that's not correct at all. Yeah, there are, but there are. retention and, in the class is one of the problems, but they do have accreditation. And I will use myself as an example. During my hiatus from teaching, because I've, I've got, uh, I'm bookending, I taught in the 20th century, and now I'm back five years into a, a renewed <laughs> You know, a teaching career in the 21st century. There's no way I would use my 20th century methods anymore because of m much of what Mark uh, presented today. And it's just, I, so the, this college credit for MOOCs, while, while I was at uh, Fulbright just doing administrative work, a friend of mine was really a big fan of, um, of um, Rebel, R-E-B-O-L, it's programming language developed by Carl Sassenrath, who he's famous for programming the Commodore 24 computer. It was one of the 64, early, 64. Commodore 64, yeah. So anyway, the, this rebel uh, scripting language, I taught myself to do it and created a script that would gather the data for my doctoral dissertation that took hundreds of hours of coding in just a couple of minutes. Now, that, I did, that was about 10 years ago that I did that. But uh, I could do the same thing today. I, actually, I sort of wanted to learn Python. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> our students in, in my department, our department, uh, the tech requirement, one way of satisfying that is uh, through learning some computer programming. Another one is maybe uh, advanced math and, and statistics. Uh, statistics are particularly important in the big data, data visualization, data mining area and everything. But the point being, smart students, and most of our students are pretty, pretty smart, I think, they're capable of, of doing this. You don't have to, you can take a course, but you can also and programming, you don't need to take it from Harvard or Stony Brook or SUNY Korea to prove that you can program in Python. You just need to learn to program. And an employer, you can put that on your resume, and an employer can quickly find out whether or not you can program. Guaranteed. So 
Somebody from computer science comes and tries to convince me otherwise, I'll look forward to that conversation because uh, people learn in different ways. And, uh, but I think we're, it's fair to, to say that most of our students are, are pretty smart and capable of uh, adapting. Hopefully our, our faculty as well. <laughs> and on that good note, I'd like to close and thank you everyone for coming. Um, thank you for staying over. We chatted about 30 minutes on this topic. So I appreciate all of you being here. Thank you, Mark. And it was recorded. So it's even pause in my flurry of speech. Thank you. Thank you.